Okay, you got Job 38. We're going to talk tonight about um, really some contradictions in evolution versus creation. I'm going to be talking a lot tonight about evolution. We'll close with some creation facts, but I'm just going to show you just how silly it gets and how far down the rabbit hole you have to go if you're going to be a believer in evolution. So the Lord says here in Job chapter 38, he is, he's been listening, he's been an observer to all the things that have been going on in this conversation between Job and his friends. And now he's coming, okay, the Lord's going to speak up. And notice the first thing that he says when he comes out of that whirlwind in verse 1, he says in verse 2, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Now that, look at that question. So the first thing he says is, who's talking out of his place? Who, who's saying all this thing, all this about everything he knows when he don't know nothing? That'd be my... <laughs> That'd be my way of explaining it. Verse 3, Gird up now thy loins like a man, but I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. And then he goes on, question after question after question, just like that. And you can go read the questions, but every question is like an indictment against Job. And by the time he gets finished with all he has to say, after Job chapter 41, Job, after those three chapters, Job 38, 39, 40, 41, after those four chapters, he just shuts his mouth and abhors himself in sackcloth and ashes. But that's where the God, that God starts. And it's basically asking Job, where were you when all this took place? So let's introduce tonight this question. What is law? What is law? Because we have scientific law. And of course, I'm not talking about the laws of men. We all understand what that is. That's regulations and precepts and things that we're to follow as far as the law goes. Some things are against the law. Some things are your right that should not be against the law. But I'm not going to go into the, the political policy of all that. What I'm talking about here is what is law, and specifically what is scientific law. And the definition of scientific law is it's an observed phenomenon. So you see something and you have sense enough to know it's there. If I do an observed phenomenon on that pew, I may not know what it is. I may not have a definition of what it is. I may not know where it came from but it's there. Observation. So here we have this phenomenon, and as soon as you have the phenomenon, and in this instance, what we have in this phenomenon is we have Earth. And of course, beyond that, we have the planets and the stars. But right there is the focus. So let's say the phenomenon is Earth, and in creation and in evolution that's the question and that's what god's dealing with right here he's talking about where were you when i laid the foundations of the earth so the question is when you have this phenomenon this thing is here the earth is here the the question isn't immediately why is it there or how did it get there that's not the question of observed phenomenon. That's scientific law. Okay, you with me so far? Nod your heads if you are. Okay, observed phenomenon, the earth is here. No question about how or why. So then we get into scientific theory over here. Theory. That's different from law. Law is just observed phenomenon. Theory wants to make a guess. It is a hypothesis. It's guessing why and how. And just because of the theory doesn't mean it's so. Evolution is a theory. They would, mock, they would come back and say, well, creation is a theory. And that's where, of course, we part ways because we have proof of creation. I'm going to show you one tonight with SpongeBob. We have proof of creation. And it's not just this, it's also kangaroos and possums 
and the desert rat and many more I'm going to show you through this study is every week I'm going to bring you one of these and you're going to walk away going, wow, how is that possible? Well, there's only way possible. It's God did it. It cannot be just, it happened out of nowhere. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So here's the theory. Theories do not necessarily make laws. Just because it's a theory doesn't mean it's true. So you can come up with a hypothesis, a guess, a theory as to how the world got here. We've got a phenomenon, and there it is. But how did it get here? Our answer is what? God did it. God made it. That's not a scientific, unless they're creation scientists, that's not what a typical scientist will say at the University of Tennessee or Vanderbilt or Yale or Columbia or anywhere else you want to go. They're not going to say the earth got here by God. They would say, well, that's just a cop out. That's just religion. That's just your belief. So they come up with other ideas. Darwin said this, that it is observed sequence of events. That's Darwin's definition. It's an observed, I'm quoting him now, it's an observed sequence of events. Now that immediately, as a word person, makes me stop in my tracks and go, oh, what does that word mean? Observed. Well, that means you can see it happen. You perceive it happened. You watch it happen. You notice it happen. Watch. Tell me if you observed this. You observed it, right? And then you can walk away with proof, it's on tape, and we've got witnesses. Hey, he stood up there and dropped the pen. And nobody can say, well, that's a theory. That's a guess. Because you saw it happen. So if Darwin's definition of law, observed sequence of events, then he's saying, by that word, somebody saw it happen, somebody perceived it happen, they watched it happen, they noticed it happened. That creates evolution, a great problem. Because who is here to see it? And we don't even really know how it happened. They've got theories, and they've got guesses, and it's come down, I guess, to some collaboration of saying, well, it was a big bang. That's how it happened. But now they're even questioning that with the new satellite they've just put out in space. They're, I've read some articles that says, we, we're not real sure how it happened. Well, if you leave this, if you leave this, you're always going to be guessing. And you're always going to be going down to dead ends and go, well, we believe that for 150 years. See, that's the problem with science. And the Bible calls it in 1 Timothy, science falsely so-called, because science is ever-changing. We've seen that in our lifetime. With the advent of cell phones, I was telling one of my sons last night, I said, I remember the dial-up. I remember, I'll show you how old I am, I remembered, I remember um, landlines that were connected. What were they called? Yeah, see, you all are older than I am. You remember that? But because of scientific discovery and, and knowledge now, things have changed. We've changed our opinions on all kinds of things. Uh, things that would have killed our grandparents, we survive with because of scientific knowledge. So I'm not, I am not ever in this study, you'll never hear me say that science has no place because God created scientists. science. He's the first scientist. He's a chemist. He's a um, physicist. He's a biologist. Doubt that. Look at how your body's made. He's all of those things. We're not against science. We're not anti-science, but we are anti-false science, falsely so-called. This doesn't even really, as I'm going to show you in just a second, this doesn't even really come to anything that makes any sense. Because we come to this question here. This all I've introduced to you takes us to this question. According to a Darwinist, law was here first, before life. There had to be certain laws in place 
because this bang that took place, however they can explain that, it never makes any sense to me. That's just because I'm too dumb or too smart. I've never figured out which it is. But I've never been able to comprehend and put my mind around that. But they believe that there was some law that took place and eventually out of that grew life. But in order to have a law, we believe the exact opposite. We believe there was life and then law. God gave life, later he gave the law. It's really hard to distinguish between those two things because above here we have a law giver and a life giver. So if you say, well, God was there and he's the law giver and he put laws into place and then he created a life, I can accept that because look what he does all the first five days of creation. He's putting laws in place and then he creates life. But ultimately it all comes from life. For he said, I am the way, the truth. He's life. So he's life and he's the lawmaker. And we don't really have to make a distinction between the two. It's not the chicken before the egg because it's God before anything. So, but evolutionists have a problem here. They want you to have law than life. So let's go over here. We got this little... Ah, this little one cell being. They've never found two. That's one of the that's one of the major problems too of evolution. Evolution's got lots of problems. But you got this one little cell, and all of a sudden, it we can't call it he or she yet. It isn't it amazing how we're going back. Now we can't call her he or she. We have to call it it. Okay, so I'm not going to go there. He, she, can't call it that. It's an it. It's a one cell. But this one cell began to grow. And lo and behold, for some reason, at some point, it stopped growing. Why? I mean, if it grows from a one cell and then something else and then something else and something else and eventually you show up. Why didn't you keep growing? The average man, I think, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm right. I'm going by guess. I didn't look it up. But I think the average man is about 5'11". I think that's the average man. And the average woman is about a little lower than that, 5'10". And the average woman is about 5'3", 5 5'4", 5 right there. Guess. 5'4". Okay. So you have that average of a man, I'm, I'm six foot, used to be, I think I'm shrinking a little bit. And you have this woman who's about five four. I, I don't know if that's the difference, but why didn't I keep going? And some did. Uh, giants, they were, they were not, they were crossbreeds. So we're talking about human beings. You have people now seven foot, seven, six, maybe an eight foot man. That's really, that's really, that's like having somebody with an IQ of 160. You know, that's just way out there. That's, less than 0.1% of the population. And then you have little people, and that again, we, we don't deny the, them being certainly uh, full human beings, but they're again on the lower edge of the spectrum. Average, 5'10", 5'4". Why did it stop there? Why did it stop there? Because if it had kept growing, then the world would become lopsided. You'd had somebody like the Pillsbury Dough Man walking around, right? And stepping on cars. You've probably seen that in some movies, Ghostbusters or something crazy. You see that. What what what's kept that from happening? Well, we know what kept it from happening. But how do they answer it? They don't know. Then you got this thing that happens. Now they don't have any evidence of it. No two cell. Okay, they never found one, but somewhere along the way, according to their theory, this thing split. It split and became two, because that's the only way you can get two genders. We're not all men and we're not all women. If we were all men, you couldn't have had population growth. If you had all women, we're not we're in biology. You know, you know, you gotta have both. So this cell splits, but the question is, where did the male and the female come from? Now we know, 
You know, it's a lot, they would say it's lazy, but it's just a lot easier to believe the Bible than all this nonsense. God created man after his own image. And then he took from the rib the woman and made him woman. And you just go, well, that's logical. That makes sense. Then you get over here to this stuff and it's one cell that became two cells. And then miraculously, you don't think there's miracles in evolution? They were the exact same in age, variety, environment, and one happened to be male and one happened to be female. Well, how did that happen? Oh, just lady luck. Like I told you last time, it's like sending a tornado into a junkyard and coming out with a brand new Nissan or whatever car you want to drive. Doesn't matter to me. Make it a Cadillac. Make it, make it a Ford Edge. I don't care what you make it. Make it a tank. It doesn't matter. It's not going to happen. It's going to happen in 10,000 earthquakes or 100,000 earthquakes. And this isn't going to happen either, male and female. So we come to this thing that you've heard about all your life when it's connected to Darwinism. I call him Chuck. His name's Charles Darwin. I won't even call him Charlie because I like Charlie Brown. So I call him Chuck. So Chuck came up with this idea of called Survival of the Fittest, and he wrote a book called The Origin of the Species. Now, don't you know that's a comical thing if you ever read it? I'd rather spend time reading Calvin and Hobbes. Survival of the Fittest. Well, a survival of the fittest is true. That is, the weaker get weaker and weaker and weaker, and eventually they are um, completely exterminated and the stronger get stronger and stronger and stronger. How does that guy still live? Oh, in fact, why is he not living and all of us dead? Because you know these little birds, this little guy right here? He can survive in ice. He can survive in air. He can survive in water. He can survive in dust. Let me tell you where he loves to live. Would you like to know where he loves to live? He loves to live in your bowels. They're there. Thousands of them. Living down in there. And they're your friends. I found out, you know, if you take too many antibiotics... It kills the good guys and leaves the bad guys and you end up having to have everybody that comes into your room put on these gowns and masks and things because if they catch it, it gets through the hospital. A lot of people will die from that and you're laying in there in the hospital going, okay, well, thanks for this. They're in there and they're living there. In fact, they can live where you can't. If you don't think that's not true, I don't believe, I'm not talking to any of you. If you don't think that's not true, just go move in the sewer for the next month. Just go down there and live. See how you come out. You know what these guys will do? They'll thrive, which tells you what? They tell you that's bunk. Because I'm telling you, they should only be the ones alive. They can live through anything. Why? The Creator made them that way. It's for your good. Some bacteria is necessary for you to live. Don't think all bacteria is bad. No, not all bacteria are bad. These are not all bad guys. Now, you got some of these guys who are bad guys, and you don't want them around, and that's why you take antibiotics and you take medicine. You try to eat right and get the right nutrients so you can hurt these guys. But you want these guys to be around. They're your friend. I'm glad they survived. Okay? So when we come to the question about how all this came to be, is it really lady luck? Did all this just happen by chance? That's what Chuck believes. It's all by chance. It's lady luck. Flip the coin. Well, this codfish has no known predator except man. And man loves to catch him and eat him. And I do too. You ever had codfish? Really good. These, these little guys will lay eggs and they'll lay 10 million of them. 
10 million eggs. Can you imagine being the mama of 10 million? 10 million eggs. Now, a lot of them don't survive. They don't make it. Because that fish likes to eat other fish. And so therefore, out of the 10 million, some of them survive, some of them don't. That's just like, that, that's no different. You say, well, that's survival of the fittest. No, that's just like the sperm and the egg. There's 10,000 sperm in a race to get to the egg and only one makes it. That doesn't mean the others weren't strong. It's just, it's God's design and God's way. God made you instead of somebody else. But what about these elephants? Now that's a little guy, lives in the water, you know, he's hard to catch. These guys you can see, they're huge. They'll live to be, oh, about 60 or 70 years old. And the female can start having babies when she's about 16. And she can have about uh, five in her lifetime. That's one every, uh, if you figure it out, I figured it out. It's about one every eight years. So she has five babies, five calves. Now, one reason I think that God had mercy on the elephants is because the elephant's uh, baby is uh, in the womb and gestating for two years. I, I, I can't relate to that, but you ladies who have had babies can imagine what it must be like. And, you know, they're out there in the, in the desert and they have to fight off predators and all that kind of thing. But see, God made that that way. 10 billion for one, five or six for the other. How are you going to explain that phenomenon? Why doesn't the elephant have 10,000 or 10 million or 100 million? Why do they have five? And why does that codfish, and it's just not one codfish, 10 million? So how many millions and billions and trillions of eggs have been laid over the years by this thing? And then God does things with birds. I'm not going to go into detail about this, but you can just think about it. If, if there were more birds than there were worms, then the earth would be a desert. We have to have the worms. So God keeps making these worms, and then every now and then he'll send a robin along. And that robin, they're fascinating to watch, aren't they? They, it doesn't seem to me they ever look down. Somebody told me they do it by listening. Maybe that's true. But they bob, bob, bob along. Remember that? The red, red robin goes bob, bob, bobbing along. That was a song years ago. And then all of a sudden they'll look down there and they'll pull that worm out. be that long. Well, if they're all worm eaters, but they're not. So pigeons, who if you ever had a bird feeder, pigeons love to come to bird feeders. They don't eat worms. So you have a lot more pigeons born than you do worm eaters. Because if they were all born like pigeons, you wouldn't have any worms. It wouldn't be enough to feed them. And then the whole thing goes amiss. See, our God keeps it in balance. Now I'm going to close tonight and tell you about old SpongeBob. Now, the sponge lives off the... Um, Gulf of Mexico. He's in the Gulf of Mexico. And this guy, let me make sure I'm saying it right. This guy has no heart, no brain, no liver, no bones, and hardly anything else. It's just a blob. You ever, you ever watch SpongeBob with your grandkids? You probably can't pretty much come to the conclusion that thing ain't much but a blob. So here's that sponge. Some, some sponges grow to be uh, quite large in length. But you can take one of those things and cut it into pieces. Now this is a phenomenal story. You cut that thing and cut it into pieces if you're so inclined. You want to murder a sponge. You take this thing, you cut it into pieces, and you can even take a towel and squeeze it so all the cells from that thing are nothing but just bunk. And you can take that bucket of bunk and throw it back into the seawater and every one of those cells will come back together and make that same sponge again. No brain, 
No heart, no liver, no bones. But something in them, the male, is sitting there in the Gulf and he's just minding his own business and something goes off in his not brain and tells him the tide's about to come in. So he takes and sprays all this seed up in, and it takes that seed and it washes it toward the shore. And the female, who's maybe a half a mile away, something in her non-brain tells her that the seed is there. And so she, in her non-brain, releases all these eggs. And those eggs from that non-brain female reaches the seed of that non-brain male, and they unite, and lo and behold, you got more sponges with no brain, no heart, no liver, no bone. How did that happen? Why did that happen? Now only a fool, leading fools, and I don't use those words lightly, but I use it in the sense of how the Bible uses it, not to just be lazy in my language, but a fool who believes that by chance will only end up leading more fools who end up denying there's a God. And we know what the Bible says about people who say there's no God. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And in Proverbs it says, if the fool leads the fool, the blind leads the blind, they both fall in the ditch. Now, these people are, many of them, I won't say all, I don't want to sweep with a long jest, but the professorship, the chucks in the world, the high brains, the high minded, they're the ones who are leading all these flocks of kids with very um, open minds and willing to learn and looking up to their educated mentor and swallowing everything he says. When we go back to our very first point, how'd he get here? If the only answer is you can come up with a theory, then you need to be quiet. Because God says, can you see it? Can you perceive it? Can you watch it? Can you notice it? God says, who was there when I did all this? And nobody can say they were there except the sons of God. They were there singing for joy and glorifying God. That's the angels. They're just glorifying God for all he's doing. So he created the angels before he created the earth. But when he's creating this, all the angels are watching and all they can do is go glory to God when he's making these mountains and making these oceans and making the bear and making the lion and causing all the grass to come up. And then he creates man and they're going, wow, wouldn't it be something to be them? Hebrews says they look in and they, they are just wonder at us. And God says, I've got witnesses. In fact, God says in John, I've got witnesses, plenty of witnesses for me, my works that I do, my Father who sent me. So we're not hurting for witnesses. We trust a God who sees and perceives and watches and notices, and then he tells us, and then he shows himself trustworthy, and we walk away going, well, amen, Lord, I don't have any argument with that. But sadly, there's a whole group in our society who've accepted that in the name of education and high learning and rejected the Lord God in the name of education and high learning. And they sadly, desiring to make themselves wise, it says, they became fools. Thank <laughs> you.